Lord Jesus, we thank you that when you ascended into the heaven, you didn't leave us alone, but you said you'd send another, another like you, that you would send your spirit. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here right now, directing, moving among us, transforming lives. And we just pray that we would hear your whisper today and we would go the way you would want. I pray that the words I speak uh, would be truth and that which is not of you, Lord Jesus, we just pray would no one would hear and they just vanish away. But we pray that, that as we focus on you, as we look to you, as we open your truth, as we speak your word, that our hearts would be thrilled and our lives would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're starting a new series. Um, so, so today's going to be a little bit different to what I'd normally do because I'm just introducing the series and I'm not really speaking on any topic per se. So I'm just going to be introducing, we're going to be, um, over the next few months, we're going to be following this book by Adam Ramsey called Truth on Fire, Truth on Fire, which is a lovely way of saying what we would always uh, be saying is, is word and spirit, truth on fire. So we're going to be going through this um, and, and the catchphrase for this is gazing at God until your heart sings. Isn't that amazing? Gazing at God until your heart sings. Um, it's a great book. If you want to get it, I, I, I recommend it. It's, it's a great read. He's, uh, he's really easy to read. He, he writes in a way that doesn't make it too hard um, to continue reading. Um, and it really draws you in. It's a great book. But we're going to be going through this. Um, at the end of every chapter is a bunch of questions, which is, as I've been reading it, has been quite challenging for me. Um, and uh, so, I'd, yeah, I'd recommend that if you want to carry on with us as we go through this series. So I'm just going to be introducing what this means. What does truth on fire mean? Um, how's it going to look? And what, what are we going to be going through in the next few months? Um, and to do that... Um, we're going to be looking at a life, the life of Abram um, before he became Abraham. Um, and, and we're going to see how this truth sets him on fire, or the truth that brings him closer to God. Because when we look at the truths of God, when we look at the Word of God, every generation, every generation that comes along has to take that truth and apply it to their situation, to where they are at. And when we were gathered um, a few weeks ago um, uh, on, on the mainland with the church from Worthing and Littlehampton, um, there was a guy there from um, Dubai called Fuzi, and he spoke about this laying foundations. And he made us, he just said a, a word, a phrase where he said, every generation needs to lay a new foundation. Every generation needs to take what God is saying and build upon that in a new way for that generation. And I was thinking about that because we often forget the things of God. We need to come back and be reminded of the things of God. We need to come back and be reminded of who he is over and over again. And as I was thinking about this, Every generation needs to lay a new foundation. I remember of, um, I remember Rick was uh, renovating a place, doing up a place um, in Gurnard uh, down the avenue, um, and there was, he was speaking about when he was going to buy it. I, I, I probably don't have all the details right, but there was something about the foundations in that place where they said they weren't up to the standards. They weren't up to the standards what they would have in this day. The foundations had been there for decades. They were fine. The foundations worked. But if they were laying that house again now, they wouldn't do the foundations the way they did it then. And so Rick was building, uh, extending out around it and was wrapping around the, the house a new um, uh, bit of building there. Um, and so the foundations he had to lay were different to the ones that were already laid. There was a foundation laid for that generation, what was de designed and required by law now, he was laying the foundations. And the interesting thing that I remember Rick saying is that actually the foundations he laid with this 
building that wrapped around is actually sustaining even more, making even more solid the foundations that were already there because it won't be able to move. It's got this bit of building that wraps around it, almost holding it in place. And see, these foundations we lay now are not to replace the foundations that have been laid by previous generations, but is actually to strengthen those foundations that have previously been laid. See, we don't deconstruct, we don't demolish what has been done to rebuild. What we take is what is good and wholesome, the foundations that are there already, and we take those and we lay a foundation that enforces that, that strengthens that. But the foundations we lay must be for this generation. And so as we look and go forward through this book, we're going to be looking at many things about God that have already been looked at. But we're going to keep gazing. We're going to keep looking at him until our hearts are set on fire. I remember a famous quote um, by John Wesley. And he says that all he tries to do, he says, I set myself ablaze and people come watch me burn. His whole heart was that he would be so on fire with the Holy Spirit that when he got up and spoke, people would just watch him burn, just watching him burn with the Holy Spirit. And we know what happened through that. The Wesleyan revivals were huge. And this is a heart that we have, that we may be set ablaze as we gaze upon God. So we're going to go right back Right back to the beginning of the Bible, right back to Genesis. And we're going to be looking at the first man that was called to become a people of God. And as we look at this, we're going to be looking at the two aspects of truth and fire. Truth being the theology you know, that, that deep down nitty gritty um, that we have to get into so that we can know the vastness of God. And sometimes we think of theology and we think it's for others. I, I used to be one of those people. I used to think theology was for those people who were smart enough to be able to understand it. I thought it was not for me, it was for those people who had to get up and speak. They had to learn theology so that they could say it properly. But theology is actually for every single one who wants to know more about God. You see, theology makes God fully known, even when we can't contain him fully. So, you know, theology removes wrong understanding. Yeah, when I watch YouTube sometimes, I, like, I, I quite like watching those um, parts of YouTubes where they create something and you just watch someone creating something. And one of these guys, he takes a, a block of whatever it is, he's made wood or epoxy or whatever it is, and, he, and it would be this big block, and he turns it into something. And when he starts out, he says, I'm going to make this into um, a whale. It was one of the ones he did. He said, I'm going to make this into a whale, and all it is is a block of wood, and I can't see the whale in that wood. I can't see it. And he comes along and he, and he draws on one side a profile of that. And I'm like, that doesn't look like a whale, that profile that he's just drawn. And then he gets a chainsaw and he, and he cuts big chunks off that doesn't need to be there. And then he does another profile on the top and he chops more chunks of this, of the, of this block. And then he starts refining it. He doesn't use a chainsaw anymore. He starts coming in and he starts using smaller tools and then smaller and smaller until all he's using is sandpaper. And by the time he's got to that point, you can actually see what it looks like. And see, theology is like this. It cuts the bits off that doesn't need to be there. We have this blocked picture of God and we're like, we can't see who you fully are, God. We're, we're almost blinded by what we know of you. And when we learn theology, it's as if God comes along and he just goes, you don't need that bit, that's not me. And he sculptures something into what we can see is him. Now, as I was thinking of this analogy, I thought it's a poor analogy. It's not a very good analogy at all. Because when, what actually happens when you learn theology is not that you sculpt a God, but that God sculptors you. He cuts a bit of you that hinders you from seeing who he is. 
Theology makes clear who God is. I've been to the optrician a few times, and whenever you get there, you, you sit down, and they've got all these machines now. You know, you sit down, and they have the one that puffs up air into your eye, and every time you're like, I'm not going to flinch, I'm not going to oh, flinched. <laughs> every time, and I say, just stand there with, you know, just sit there with your eye open every time it gets me. Um, and then they sit you down in a chair, and they, um, well, I don't know if they still do. Probably been a while since I went, but they used to put these glasses on you to see. You know, they put different lenses in front to see. Can you read the the, the letters? You know, does this one help? Does that one make it clear? Now the problem with me is, uh, you know, I have 20/20 vision at the moment. So every time they put something in, I'm like, yeah, it's, uh, no, that's no good. No, that's no good. But I can imagine that if you're slightly needing glasses, that when you're trying to look at that, it's a bit blurry. And then when they put the lens in, all of a sudden it comes in a bit clearer. And you go, no, that's a bit clearer. And then they put a, another lens in front of that. And you go, no, that's, that's, that's clearer still. And then they put another one in. And you go, yeah, that's it. I can see it clearly. That's what theology is like. It's like the lenses of our eyes be able to see more clearly who God is. This is the truth. This is what we need. We need theology. The downside to theology is if you are just stuck in theology, as you're stuck learning about stuff, if the only reason you're doing theology is to have greater knowledge, you just become dry and often boring. Theology is not the end goal. The end goal is that we might be set on fire. The end goal is that our hearts may be ablaze with God himself. But theology is the foundation we lay upon which we can stand and shine. So we need theology. It shapes us. It gives us a firm foundation. It helps us when we start going wrong. It brings us back. So I want to look at this from the life of Abram. And we're just going to go through some of the stories of Abram and see the difference that it makes when he understands more fully who God is. When his knowledge, his theology of God is right-sized, is brought into the truth of what it is, and you see how his life changes. So if you want to, turn with me to Genesis 13.10. And we're going to look at Abram. Now up to this point in the story, um, Abram has been called by God to come out of the land of the Chaldeans um, and come to the land of the Canaanites into what would be known as the promised land. And so Abram's come. He's left all his family, or most of his family. He's got a... Um, uh, he's got Lot, who uh, is, is tagged along with him, who is his um, nephew. And Lot and Abram have come along into the to promised land. Um, and from there, they've, they've been there for a while. And then after that, um, they kept on traveling through Canaan and they went down into Egypt. And there's a, there's a whole story in Egypt about how um, Pharaoh saw Sarai, Abraham's wife, and wanted her for himself. And then God prevented that and, and, and came to the Pharaoh in a vision. And, and because of that, the Pharaoh was terrified that God was going to um, you know, curse him or, or, or destroy him. So he, he sent Abraham away with wealth and of flocks and gold and silver and sent him away and say, bless me, bless me, but you must go. And so Abram and Lot leave Egypt and it says that they were, that Abram was very rich. In verse 2 it says, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and gold. So here's a man lacking no material worth. He's, he's not rich, He's not well off, 
He's not doing okay. He's very rich. He's not looking to God as a provider at this stage because he seems to have everything he needs. In fact, he has not just everything he needs, he has more than anything he could ever hope for. Abraham was very rich. And because of this, Lot also shared in that wealth, because in that time you, you always shared with your family. Your family was everything. And so your wealth always flowed into your family. So it was not Abram keeping it for himself, but his whole family was rich. So when it says he was very rich, it was not just him, but all who were part of him, all who was in his household, they also were very rich. And Lot also had loads of livestock. And there comes this confrontation between the, the, the Lot's livestock and Abram's. And so great were they that they couldn't be in the same place at the same time. And they would fight over the resources because there was just too much of them. And so Abram goes to Lot and he says, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right hand. If you take the right hand, then I'll go to the left. So here's Abram saying, we don't need to strive. We don't need to have strife and conflict and confrontation. There's plenty. Not only do we have plenty of stuff, there's plenty of space. It's okay. And Abram in this moment, he's like, I've got so much. It doesn't matter where I go, I've got it. You choose where you want to go, I'll be okay. And this is a difference I want to point out right now between someone who knows something of God and someone who does not. Someone who knows God and someone who's only known of God. And this is it. Listen to what Lot does. And Lot lifted up his eyes, this is important, and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. Now that may sound like, yeah, that sounds, he's just seen it and that's what it looks like. It's, he's just describing it. But it's interesting to see when we go through this story is how often it refers to where the eyes of the people are looking. And here, Lot's eyes are not looking towards what God would want, but his eyes are looking to what he really wants. And he sees this lush valley. And this is also someone who knows a bit of God, a bit about God, but doesn't know God himself because he compares it to the Garden of Eden and Egypt. And all through Scripture, these two are actually normally designated as the opposite things. The Garden of Eden, meaning paradise and things to do with heaven and those of God. Egypt was always refers to as the world and those things that would take you away from the presence of God. And here he is mixing these two things up, saying this land is both godly and worldly. And yet these things cannot intermix. And so Lot sees this, his eyes see this, and this is what he goes towards. And so Lot sets off and chooses the Jordan Valley and settles down there. But after this, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. The difference between this is when Lot was given a choice, his eyes look to the valley. When Abram is given his choice, he's listening for God. He's looking to God. And God says, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes and see who I am, Abram. Not only will I give you this land, I'm going to give you more than you even thought you could have. I'm giving you whatever you can see now in the physical because you are looking and seeing me in the spiritual. It is all for you, this promise. And God enlargens the promise he has given to Abram because his eyes are looking 
at God. And we know that Abram is looking at God. And we know that this is his heart. Because the very first thing he does after God's finished speaking to him, it says this. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mem- memory, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. The Lord speaks, says, lift up your eyes. Abram lifts his eyes up, and then God says, now I give you this promise. And Abram's response is this, worship. He literally sets something on fire to give praise and worship to God because he's seen something of God And he is worshipping. The response Abram has is to go and worship. The response Lot has is to go settle in a place that is far from God. How we see God forms the reactions we have. How we see God forms how our life plays out. We carry on the story and we get to chapter 15 and the story goes on and and lot is in uh, seems to get himself in trouble time and time again and here lot is in the valley but the valley has now been uh, at war between these kings five kings versus four kings and they come together and they fight and the four kings win and they take all the possessions and all the livestock and all the people of those that they conquered and lot was among them because he was in the valley at the time and so lot gets taken off and abram hears this and so abram rallies his men he rallies the men of his family and those who are uh, allied with him and it says that there's 318 or so of them and here they are they go after these kings these four kings that have just defeated five and abram falls upon them and defeats them and and captures everything and brings back everything that was stolen and more And as he comes back, he comes down to uh, the 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 five kings who had lost everything, and he says, "Here's here's what has been taken from you." And they say, "Keep what you want, Abram. Just give us the people back." And Abram's response is this: "I have lifted my hand to the Lord God, God Most High." possessor or creator of heaven and earth and i would take and i would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours lest you should say i have made abram rich and here's he he's looking so much at god that god has gripped his heart and he has seen what god has done in egypt he's seen that god has made him rich and not only has he made him rich god has promised him a whole land to be able to be in and abraham's heart is so gripped by this knowledge of god that god is a possessor he is a creator he is the one who is over all he is the provider that he doesn't need anything from these kings he says it's not you who have made me rich i don't need your stuff god makes me rich i am rich in him And so Abram just gives it all back and says, I don't want any of it. And then God speaks. And in verse 15, sorry, chapter 15, God says this to Abram. Now get this. This is in the context of Abram's just won a battle. He's just done something that these kings could not. He's defeated these people and he brought all this wealth back and given it back to him. And this is what God says. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. The response God has, and almost seems like Abram knows this, but it's confirmed once again by God. God says, I am your shield. So Abram knows that God is the creator, the possessor of heaven and earth. He, he is over it all. And now God is saying nothing. He's revealing something else about him. He says, I'm your shield. Not only do I provide for you, not only am I giving you what you need, and more than that, I'm your 
shield. I'm the one who protects you. You think that you protected yourself going, I protect you. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. This conversation that Abram has in chapter 15 here is one of the pivotal ones of all Scripture. It is one that is referred back to in Second Chronicles and in Isaiah and then later on in James in the New Testament. They refer back to this part of Scripture because this is where they define Abram as a friend of God. And in this here, Abram not only knows that this is a, he's not seeing this as a distant God. He's not seeing this as an untouchable, unknowable God. There is something that Abram already has experience of God, that God is knowable. And not only that, that God actually listens. Because the very first thing Abram does is he questions God. He goes, O oh Lord God, what will you give me for I continue childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And here's this guy who knows God so well, knows him to be the creator of all things, knows him to be his shield now, and yet he knows him enough to be able to say, But the very thing I want, Lord, the very thing I want, God, is that I may give this to my son. What I want is for what you have provided me. I want to give on to my son. Now there's something in the heart of every single parent who wants to give the best to their children, who wants to give the absolute top of the line that they can. When they see their children, they want to be able to pass on something of value of worth, that, they, that their child can come and that they would be able to take this and that it would be of benefit to them. Every father, every mother has in their heart the desire to better their children. Every parent has this. And Abram's saying, you've given me all this, but who do I have to pass it on to? Who do I have that is mine to be able to say, now I give you all that I have? And then God answers. He says, this man will not be your heir, but your own son will be your heir. And then this is what God does. The truth is coming, but this is the fire. This. God says to Abram, come, Abram. Come outside of the tent. And he calls him out. And he says, look. Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then God said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord and God counted it to him as righteousness. Revelation of God. Get this. The theology of the truth, the revelation of God leads to relationship with God. It leads to knowing the one who knows everything. It leads to being in the palm of the hands of the one who has everything. Revelation leads to relationship. God, God is now speaking to Abram almost as a friend would speak to another Abram has his revelation of God, and now this relationship of Abram being able to pour out his heart to God, and God not just, not just hearing it and saying, yeah, but I'm God, I'll do what I want, Abram, get in line. But God actually saying, I hear what you say, Abram. Now come with me, come and look to the heavens. Let your heart be amazed. Let you be in awe of all that I have done. You know me as the creator of all things. See all this. I speak to you and say, you will have a son. And Abram believed him. Abram believed him and it was counted to him as righteousness.
And the story goes on. After Abram's believed him, he says, yeah, I believe you will give me a son. The Lord said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. And Abram said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I will possess it? Theology is this. When we want to know more about God, do you know what we have to do? We have to ask questions. We have to ask questions that would allow us to dig deeper. Abram is not afraid to ask questions of God because he knows God has revealed himself as shield. I am your shield. I am your protector. So Abram's not afraid that God is going to destroy him because God has already said, I am your protector. So Abram comes to him in this confidence, in this hope, in this humility that says, you will protect me, but I don't get it. I don't understand it. And God doesn't shoo him away. No, God actually allows him to talk with him and actually brings him closer. And the amazing thing that comes out of this is God makes a covenant with Abram and says, I will bind myself to this promise, Abram. In the Old Testament times, a covenant would always be made to the lesser, would make a covenant to the greater. The lesser would always come to the greater and say, I will bind myself to you because you're greater. And here we have a story where Abram's saying, I don't understand how you're going to do this. And God, the greater, comes down and says, I will bind myself to this promise, Abram. I will bind myself to the lesser so that you may know me and you may know that I will do this. And in this moment when God is coming to form this covenant, and Abram has, has, has got the sacrifice and he's cut them in half and he's put them out. Um, and according to the, the covenant that would be in the old days is that you would put them on either side and the person of lesser um, value would walk through between these saying, as I walk between these, these things that have been cut apart, I bind myself to the greater. And so Abram's done what God has asked, he's put these aside and then God causes a deep sleep to fall on Abram. And it says this. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain. Now it's a strange way of describing what God is about to do or what God is doing in making a covenant. Abram describes it as a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. It made me think of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. I'm going to read a little bit from here and then I'm going to finish up. And this is a part of the, where the, the children have come into, the, um, into Narnia and the beavers have found them and the beavers have taken them off into their home to feed them. And they start to talk about Aslan. Who is Aslan? asks Susan. Aslan, said Mr. Beaver, why, don't you know, he's the king. He's the lord of the whole wood, but not often here, you understand. Never in my time or my father's time, but the word has reached us that he's come back. He's in Narnia at this moment. He'll settle the white queen all right. It is he, not you, that will save Mr. Tumnus. Is is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan a man? said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I, feel, I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, 
they're either braver than most or just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's king, I tell you. I'm longing to see him, said Peter, even if I do feel frightened when it comes to the point. When you go into the deepness of God, it's not always what you expect. And here Abram is describing something that is undescribable. He's trying to describe something that he's never experienced before. And I don't know about you, but if you're trying to ex explain an experience you've never had, you don't have the words to explain it. And here Abram is saying, Behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon me. It was not something that caused him to fear or to run away, but it was something of great depth that showed that God was greater and more, and he's wider and higher and deeper than he could ever comprehend. And Abram was in this moment experiencing a revelation of God that is seldom known by humankind. And out of this deepness, God speaks and he says, No for certain. See, in the depths and the deepness of God, certainty comes. You see, theology builds a platform, a rock upon which we stand, which makes us know that we are certain. We know the hope we have. We know the one who we are worshipping. There is more we could go on with Abram's life. Time does not allow us. Knowing God, understanding what it is, digging into the theology of the scriptures is what allows us to love God more. Jen Wilkins said, The heart cannot love what the mind does not know. The heart cannot love what the mind cannot, does not know. And this is a simple truth, yet so profound. Marriages don't work if you never actually see the one you're married to. Friendship does not work if you never actually Spend time with your friends. You get to know people, and as you know people more, it's a natural thing for you to love them more. Potentially, hopefully. As you know God more, your heart can love him more. I just want to finish by reading from um, the book. Adam Ramsey, he says, God intends for us to pursue a Christianity that is radically committed to theological clarity in a way that does not diminish the life of the heart, but actually intensifies it. When we hear and we speak of God, it should intensify our love for him. It should set our hearts a blaze that should put fire upon our hearts that says, not only do I know you more, but I love you more. And I want to know you fully. Theology is a foundation of our worship. It displays before our mind the God we worship. Or Adam Ramsey also says in his book that theology is the rocket fuel of our worship. It's the rocket fuel. It's a thing that compels us. It's a thing that invigorates us. As we know more of God, our worship deepens. So the next few months, we're going to be looking at God. We're going to be looking at the incommunicable attributes of God. Those are the attributes of God that only apply to God. He's transcendence, he's omnipotence, these things that are only God's and God's alone. We're also going to be looking at the communicable attributes of God. Those are the attributes of God that are God's but are also found in us in 
faithfulness, love, goodness. These are the attributes and characteristics of God that actually should be seen more and more in us. And so we're going to look over the next few months at God. And we're going to be gazing at God until our heart sings. Let me finish by just reading this last bit, and then we'll have communion together. Adam Ramsey writes, My hope is to paint a biblical portrait of what God is actually like, so that, when, so that we can gaze upon him together until our hearts can't help but sing, to behold him in such a way that our daily experience is transformed with a deepened awareness of who it is we pray to, who it is that is with us, and who it is that we are loved by. To think about our God more deeply in order to enjoy him more intensely. To let God's truth set hearts on fire. Lord Jesus, we pray that this would be the truth in our lives. That our gaze would be lifted up, that where we look matters that we would not look to the valleys, but that we'd look to the heavens, that we'd look to where you say, look here. May our eyes be lifted. May our gaze settle upon him who displays what God is like, upon Jesus Christ, who is the perfect imprint of the invisible God. And may our hearts sing, and may our emotions be enabled to intensify in the worship and the joy and the privilege of knowing you more. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.